everything that we tell ourselves about the future, we made up. Like even me at that sitting at that rock bottom, being anxious and, and scared is I'm obviously, uh, okay, I'm scared. What am I scared about? I'm scared about never finding love again. I'm scared about, about never finding a job again. I'm scared about all these things. Again, I'm, I'm making that up. And I'm, so understanding that you're just making this up. Mm-hmm. You're making this up. So if all of these are things that my brain made up, what if I just tell myself better stories? So that understanding that you're just making this shit up <laughs> is is super important to then allowing yourself to tell yourself better stories about the future. Born in 92 on the block with the sharks, come from a different cloth, y'all would get ripped apart. You want a diamond, then you gotta get it in the dark. We dropping nuggets like Carmelo with the rock apart. Now we eat it from state to state, we scrape the plate. I put my eggs in a basket, took a leap of faith. I took a chance, now we grow and see the impact. Decoding success with special guests, now let's bring Mac. Kiana, welcome to Decoding Success. I absolutely love to see what you've created with your life. It's incredible what you continue to create nonetheless. So welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Excited to be here. Cool. So we're going to jump right in because I need the details here. I am really, really curious to get your version of your story versus, you know, what's out there on the internet. Um, Welfare in your 20s, fired from your job, and you built such an incredible life for yourself. Uh, And I'm not going to throw dollar dollar signs or money amounts around, but I'm just really curious. Like at that point in your life, welfare in your 20s, fired from your job, it's very easy to quit per se. Um, and I know like 20s into your 30s, maybe some people would even say into your 40s, life is like kind of just starting. So I'm just curious, like, what was that like? What was that experience like for you? It's interesting because so welfare, so I wasn't directly on welfare, by the way, I was like, <laughs> because I wasn't a US citizen, I was at a house of somebody else who was on welfare. So I'm mm-hmm. um, but in I just don't. So it's interesting, because we're like, Oh, interesting, like, yep, but now I'm an American citizen. And it wasn't the first time that I had hit rock bottom. I'm pretty familiar with gaining some success and then blowing it off. It happened to me when I was in Japan as well. And then I picked myself back up and then I kind of fall back again. This time around, I kind of recognized this pattern that I achieved some, what, some sort of success. And then I let, I kind of screw it over, screw it up. And I realized that the problem was me. And the fact that First of all, I had this mindset issue that I maybe don't deserve happiness. Maybe I don't deserve money. Maybe I don't deserve that boyfriend or whatever that is because all of them happen at the same time. Like my boyfriend also dumped me and I quit, I got fired from my job. I'm like, oh my gosh, like what's happening? And it was becoming that statistic that when things, bad things happen, they continue to happen. So um, it, it started with a mindset shift that was very gradual, but the good thing was that I was at least now aware of it, that it was me. It wasn't the boy friend who dumped me. It wasn't the boss. It was actually me kind of causing it somehow. So that was the first step. And then continuing to keep up and growing the mindset has been what has helped me to go through the ups and downs because it is hard. Like still, it's sure. not, it has not been an easy, like smooth sale at all. Absolutely. I appreciate the transparency first and foremost. And I love that you sort of brought up psychology in a sense here. I want to dive into that. You know, you mentioned that and I could resonate with it on a very high level, you know, achieving some form of success, whatever that may be monetary, you know, a position, whatever it is, right, and then losing it. Uh, And you mentioned that, you know, you kind of maybe subconsciously, maybe not consciously, but subconsciously, you realize like, hey, maybe I didn't feel like I was worth this or whatever that was. How did you find that out? Like, what was it that said, oh, shit, like, this is what's really happening? Well, the awareness came from the movie The Secret. So I have been watching The Secret since 2008 when it first came out. And I was like very big on affirmations and things like that. But, you know, so you live and learn. Repetition is key to mastery. Um, So I think it was that I went back and rewatched The Secret after this happened and I was like, ah, you know what? I track at this. <laughs> I tra- this is me. This is on me. <laughs> okay. So, so then what I did though, I started, I was like, I made it a habit. I would watch the secret every, like every week. The first, that's like, so interesting. 
because uh, like you get back because if you just you can't help but to want to feel sorry about yourself like when mm. these things are happening so and it was very hard just on my own I didn't have a coach or anything so I, it was very hard on my own to like keep with the mindset stuff so I had to rewatch it over and over again so that it kind of becomes a mantra it's like gets in, like into my brain drilled into my brain so yeah, I totally respect it. It's funny because we actually just had Dr. Joe Vitale, who was in The Secret on the show last week. Um, we had Dr. John Martini on the show last week, who's also in The Secret. And we've had John Asaroff, who's in The Secret, uh, many months ago. But I'm curious, like, what's your biggest takeaway from the movie? I mean, you've watched it, I'm, I'm sure, many times. Like, what was the absolute biggest takeaway from that? So it's interesting because after that, so you've had, so I've also interviewed Bob Proctor and Jack Canfield from The Secret. So the biggest thing takeaway was actually when I'm setting, now this is more future pacing, right? So when setting my goals, actually feeling it, actually mm. feeling it and believing that this is good, I deserve it. That was the biggest takeaway because I was already like doing setting goals. I'm like, yeah, I want to be rich. I want to have this, I want to have that. But getting more deep, and starting to believe and writing in my future diary. And um, the, the believing part was the one that was very hard to do on my own when I was at rock bottom. And that's why I had to um, keep watching it and then keep imagining myself as my future self. Right. Now, in regards to, and I, I definitely agree with this, like being able to feel the achievement of the goals, what's your advice to someone listening to this right now to help them actually feel it, whether that be the emotions that may come about or the physical feeling of, you know, maybe attaining something? So it, one thing that, again, now this is like years later that I'm understanding is that everything that we tell ourselves about the future, we made up. Like even me at that, sitting at that rock bottom, being anxious and, and scared is I'm obviously, uh, okay, I'm scared. What am I scared about? I'm scared about never finding love again. I'm scared about, about never finding a job again. I'm scared about all these things. Again, I'm, I'm making that up. And I'm, so understanding that you're just making this up. Mm -hmm. You're making this up. So if all of these are things that my brain made up. What if I just tell myself better stories? So that understanding that you're just making this shit up is, is super important to then allowing yourself to tell yourself better stories about the future. And for me, what really helps is writing it down. Mm -hmm. So I, I could like reading through it now, I've become obviously better at it at, because repetition is a key, a key to mastery. So I, I can actually feel and imagine it just by reading through my a morning routine that I do still to this day. I try to do it at least every day uh, or at least once a week. But um, writing it helps solidify that belief. And one other thing that wasn't mentioned in the, uh, in the movie, but Jack Canfield personally told me was setting a deadline is super important because um, and, and ha giving yourself more. So for example, one of my goals was, okay, I want to make $7 million. And I was like, okay, I've, what, I've been imagining it as I'm doing all the things, right? Why haven't I made $7 million? And I literally asked this from Jack Canfield like two years ago. And I was like, okay, did you set a deadline? I'm like, no. It's like, well, you're probably going to get it. Maybe you're going to get it when you're 60. I'm like, ah, okay, I'm going to set a deadline. And rest assured, we had like $7 million, like by the deadline that I had set. So deadlines are also... Uh, super important just to get yourself into that like you want to feel okay by the time I'm 40 this is how I'm feeling by the time I'm 45 this is how I'm feeling um so the deadline was one of the biggest takeaways that I learned after the fact I love that now I'm really curious because you know you were mentioning that you were like vibrating on a level of fear whether that be fear about finding a boyfriend fear about finding a new job if you didn't, and I'm just curious to learn your belief system here. If you didn't shift out of that, do you feel like where you were oper operating from, not operating, wow, um, operating from, would do you feel like you would have actually found a boyfriend or a job if you stayed on that level? Or maybe, maybe it wasn't the I right- I probably would have, because okay. I've always been very motivated, like since I was a child, but the shift was that I would have then destroyed it. Mm, right. Okay. So, so that was my problem. 
I, I like my problem was achieving success and then ruining it. <laughs> right. So that's been that that's but so everybody has a different problem. So it sure. really is important to understand for you is achieving the success, the one that is the problem, then 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 you have to work on that. If you can achieve the success and then you can't keep the success, then you have to work on that. So um, of course, well, at the time that I was at rock bottom, I was scared that, okay, maybe this time I'm not going to be able to achieve the success, but um, um, I kind of, I kind of caught it earlier this time around. And right. um, I mean, to answer your first question though, like, did I ever feel like quitting? Yes. Hell yes. Absolutely. Yes. Like it does get hard, especially like being on your own. And I decided not to actually get a job and decided to pursue a career on my own and becoming my own boss. So as you might know, it's not an easy route. And um, I, I absolutely did feel like quitting. Yeah. It, times. Yeah. It's kind of part of it in a sense. I think that comes up for a lot of people. Um, I, I want to talk about goals. Uh, you know, you mentioned goals and I'm really curious and I agree with the whole set a deadline thing without a doubt. I'm just curious what your take is in regards to not feeling the pressure of the deadline that you set for yourself, though. Like, yeah, in, in a way it is healthy. Um, like there is a, I think there's a boundary of like health or a, a measurement of like healthy pressure versus unhealthy pressure. And it could create stress. And it's like you, you don't want to feel like a failure, even though you didn't hit that goal by that deadline. Like there's just so many ways you can go with that. So what, what's your mindset there? Totally. So that's why my first goal, uh, rule of goal setting is it needs to feel achievable to you. Mm. So like, if like, you don't want to go and set your first goal, something ridiculous that you don't believe. I mean, first of all, you can't achieve whatever you want, but you have to believe that's because the belief is so important. Making your goal something that feels achievable to you, especially your first time around, it is super important. So, um, so again, so I was like, oh, I want to make $7 million. Then I was like, okay, this is just like, like when I'm like at zero, this just doesn't feel real. So I actually changed it. Like, okay, I'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars by this year. And I was like, okay, I can break it down to make a hundred thousand dollars. I need to have like this many clients and like sell them this many offers and I need to make this kind of investment. So the road was a little bit more clear to me. And then I became the kind of person who would make a hundred thousand dollars per year. Then once I hit that goal, now, um, I actually do now have a vision board. I'm just looking at it right now over here. So I have like, I have this little line uh, in, in, in the middle of it. And I just have like the sticky, sticky notes over here like this. And I just write my goal, set a deadline. And then once it's completed, I move it to the next side and I say, okay, this is the date that it was completed. Now, rest assured, some of them, they get completed before the date that I had set. Some of them I haven't hit yet. And it's, it's just a date. If it's like bothering me, I'll just reset it. Like that's not set in stone. It's just a guideline for yourself. So um, you definitely don't want to be like, oh my gosh, okay, I didn't meet the deadline. All right, it's done. Bye. I'm quitting. Like give yourself that grace to right. update your goals. Update Absolutely. Them. Now, not to get, I mean, too intimate here, but like what are some of the things on your vision board and maybe some of your goals right now? Totally. I, I can't read it from here, but... <laughs> So with my business, so, so by 2025, this is our actually company mission as well is I want to have helped 1 million moms or more take control of their financial future. So that is one goes to 1 million. So we have to find a way how to measurably have helped 1 million or more moms by, by 2025. One of my goals that literally just became true is like just, okay, a month ago, but it was, we wanted to celebrate um, I, I had set a goal that by May 29th of 2022, I'm going to have celebrated one or more of my students having achieved a million dollar portfolio. So we celebrated that actually it was December 29th, 2021. So it happened five months earlier, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, so there are a lot of business related ones. I have uh, my personal goals. I want to have a second child by the way. So a lot of them are five-year goals that I wrote like uh, a year ago. Is like, I'm going to we're, we're have a, we're have a seven second child. We're living in this kind of house. I'm just looking at it. 
so I have visions about the house we want to live in and um, the kind of person that I want to be, the kind of leader that I am. So it's business, money, and relationship. And oh, yeah, fit and hot is in the list. Fit and so. hot. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, I actually want to jump backwards. You mentioned being an immigrant. I'm just really curious whenever I speak to people that come to America, which many people outside of the country look at as, you know, the country of where your dreams can come true. Um, you know, I have clients that say that, um, that have came from Cuba, that have literally came from Afghanistan, literally all over the world. I'm curious, do you feel like you had any advantage, advantages and or disadvantages being an immigrant here? I think it's all advantage because we are not spoiled. <laughs> so I feel like Americans, a lot of them have become spoiled and I actually don't see um, the gift that America has to give. Mm -hmm. And I, I live in Iran and then I lived in Japan, which is a first world country. At the time when I was living there, it was actually the second largest economy in the world. And no, I couldn't have achieved what I wanted to, what I have achieved here in Japan, because they won't allow you. The society is a society that doesn't, doesn't reward individualism, doesn't reward entrepreneurship. Now, does America has problems? Yes. Hell yes, it does have problems. But for somebody who's motivated and wants to make something out of nothing, I, America has been absolutely amazing. Now, mm -hmm. being an immigrant or being a woman so that, that, that was like me, just the advantage of me being able to see <laughs> that I can do these things. Whereas Americans, majority, some, some of them do, some of them don't. And um, I mean, I'm, I don't want to get too political about it, but like this thing, oh my gosh, the government, and we're going to like make a revolution. I'm like, oh, ch just like chill out, you guys, like you're ruining something good. Like, stop it. This happened to my country. Like we had it well, we had a great in Iran. And then people were like, oh, we want to no, no, And they made a revolution. And like, we're now a dumpster. So don't do it, Americans. Like, it's good. You're still better than many other countries. Healthcare, yes, of course. All right. We, like, th there are so many different things that we can talk about. I don't want to get political about it. But if you have a goal and you want, if you have a dream and you want to achieve it, I 100% believe that America is the place to be. So mm. congratulations for being in the right place in the right time. <laughs> I love this. I love this. Talk to me why investing? Oh, that is interesting. So my background is not money or investing. Um, I, I kind of became fascinated by the whole financial world when I was in Japan. 2008 happened. The market crash happened. I didn't yep. know what market crashes. I didn't know what stocks are. I had no idea what banks do, like nothing. But I did hear that, oh, companies are going bankrupt. And then the governments are getting printing money. I'm like, oh. And then so the one thing that I understood was that because the governments are printing money, the value of the US dollar is going lower. So then in Japan, I had Japanese yen, right? I'm like, oh, so that means I can exchange my Japanese yen for the US dollar at a lower rate. Like that I understood because, you know, when you go to another country, you become used to, you get sure. used to exchanging your currency. So I was like, oh my gosh, I'm going to like exchange it for US dollar at a lower price. And then I don't want to, go into too much detail, but I accidentally, by, by doing this through a broker that somebody else set up for me, I made $10,000 during the market crash. I'm like, what is happening like in a month? And I'm like, what? Companies are going bankrupt and I make money? Like, how is this possible? So I became super fascinated about this. I also was learning that, you know, because the governments are printing money, like leaving your money in the bank is like, it's going to devalue it because of inflation. Again, I didn't know what inflation is, but like somebody told me, oh, you have to invest it. I'm like, what's investing? So I was like, I became fascinated. Um, and so much so that I decided to move to New York and learn and get a job on Wall Street. So mm. that, that's what happened. So the job on Wall Street, is that the job that you, that you ended up losing? Yes. <laughs> oh, it is. Okay. So this is where it all connects. Yeah. That's so interesting. Okay. So talk to me about, I mean, I'm assuming that you went all in on investing with yourself after that job. Is that correct? Yes. So I went, so I went on wall street. I, I, I got a job in a foreign exchange broker because that was like all I kind of knew. So, um, and then after I lost the job, 
I was like, okay, so investing is cool. It looks like women are not involved. So there were so many things that I learned through my time in Wall Street and how the Wall Street boys kind of screw you over. So I was in the middle of it at the broker who screws people over. Um, and it was like, okay, this is not cool. And that was that was kind of the spark that, okay, I want to help women start investing. Mm, and I love take this. my other financial future. So that's 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 the story. Yeah. Now talk to me about the pivot from job to investing with your, you know, investing on yourself. Like if I thought about that and maybe we're different here, but how did you not like just swing for the fences or maybe you did swing for the fences and just try to like hit a home run right away and, you know, make bank right away. Is that something you tried to do or like, what's your advice not to do that? I did. And I lost money. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So this is what happened, right? So of course, when I got lost, when I lost the job, uh, they kind of paid me out for a while because they, they fired me. So I had some money coming in and I absolutely, I was like, all right, so let me like find some trades. And then I was doing some gigs here and there. And I was like, I, I knew I wanted to be on my own at this point, but I wanted to like make more money and like learn, learn something on the side. So, um, actually the story is like, I learned how to read from a teleprompter. So I became a reporter of New York stock exchange. And that was great because I'm like, okay, great. Now that not only I'm going to like make some money and reporters make like really low money, by the way, but I was like, okay, I'm, I'm surrounded by all the traders. Let me, let me see what they're doing. And so I got kind of confident and I had like, I was like accumulating like $15,000 at that point. It's like a year or two later. And I was like, all right, let's, let me go all in. And for us assured trading the app didn't work. So blew out, learned the hard way that you don't day trade, you invest. So mm. there's been a lot of ups and downs. So first, because I was like, I started with Forex trading, which is like super risky. And that's all I knew. And years into it, I learned about value investing and then investing in yourself and then compounding through different methods. So it's an evolving, I've been evolving. Even like last year, I've been evol evolving. Um, learning that it's actually better to increase your income through your business and then put that money into your investment account so that it compounds, makes more money. So uh, that is how I compound. I do not day trade anymore at all. And um, majority of my focus is to invest in myself to acquire skills that are higher income creating. And then I go increase my income and then I go and invest that money into my portfolio, which is a lot less time consuming. So most Absolutely. of my time is actually running my business now. What are some of the skills you're investing in yourself? Oh, so a lot of it has to do with different aspects of entrepreneurship because okay. that's where money is at. That's where you have the most amount of control. I knew I didn't want to be like, okay, there is a route that you can go and become a day trader, a professional day trader. I already know that's not, that wasn't me. I didn't want, not want to become a professional day trader. The amount, the level of stress is just not for me. And um, it is a lot riskier. So I, I went into this entrepreneurship journey. So I started out with investing in myself, learning about marketing and funnels and PR, and then writing a book and then learning how to do sales properly and then learning public speaking. So it, it's a storytelling. Like right now I'm like investing myself about like storytelling and that, that I'm practicing right now, by the way. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, yeah, all the, all, everything that goes with higher income creation, because higher income is created where you communicate something like salespeople, marketer, marketers, storytellers, and, and combine it with your imagination. That is where the most amount of money can be made. So that, that is where I'm focusing my investments in myself. No, it's awesome. I love that. What's your advice for people listening to this to not invest emotionally? Mm. Don't invest emotionally. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, all right. Okay. So are you talking about investing in the stock in the, like the, I don't know. Yeah. In the market. All right. So this is what you're going to do. The first thing that majority, like when you go and you want to start investing, most people are like, okay, let me go on Twitter and see what Elon Musk is saying or like what's trending. Let me go buy Doge to the moon, whatever. So this is what you don't want to do. The first step in investing is actually not investing. The first step in investing is understanding your risk tolerance. 
because mm -hmm. investing just like personal finance is actually very, very personal. So I get into my DMs like every day. Okay, Kiana, just tell me that one stock or that one crypto that's going to make me a million. I'm like, it doesn't work that way because emotion, and I'm glad that you asked, that, asked me this because emotions is what makes or breaks your investment portfolio. And you will not get confident in your portfolio unless you have done your due diligence in, from within. So, and your risk tolerance, again, is not just, oh, I have a very high risk tolerance or, oh, I have a very, it's not just your personality. So would it be okay if I talk a little bit about what risk tolerance really is? Please, yeah, by all means. All right, so risk tolerance actually has three components. Number one is your willingness to take a risk, which is what most people like are aware of. They're like, okay, I'm like, whatever, I'm single. I don't have that much like thing to worry about or, oh, I'm nearing retirement years. I don't want to lose what I have. So it depends on your age and your personality. And there's a questionnaire that you can like fill out and figure out what your willingness to take a risk is. And, and, and I can, by the way, give it to your, to give to your audience if they want it. Um, and, and then the second component is your ability to take a risk. So this is very different. Your ability to take a risk is where you stand financially. What is your net worth? Is it positive or is it negative? Do you have a lot of debt? Do you have good debt or bad debt? Do you, are you cash flow positive or negative? What does that mean? Is like the amount of money that is coming in is more than the money that you're spending, right? So these are going to show you where you stand in terms of ability to take a risk, which is super important. But then there is a third component that is even more, more important. And that is your knowledge, your personal knowledge and confidence in the asset that you're investing in. So no matter how high your risk tolerance is, if you get into an asset just because you heard about it here on a podcast, on Twitter or something, and at the time it's going up and you're excited about you get in, if you actually don't know what that asset is, what derives its value, then the moment the markets crash, you are going to shit your pants and you're going to sell. And vice versa. If you're confident in that asset, the moment the markets drop, you're like, yay, I'm going to buy more. Mm. So the emotional management really comes down to your confidence and knowledge. And that is something that you have to go and acquire. That is an investment you have to make in yourself. And that's why I always say the place you want to start with investing is just go with what you know. Go look at your credit card. What are the, card, what are the companies you're spending the most money with every month? Right. As a customer, you have a lot of insights about their operations. Do you like them? Do you think you're going to stick with them for the next five, 10 years as a customer? Do you think their category even is going to be relevant in the next 10, five to 10 years? These are the questions you want to, you want to be asked. Are they actually resolving a real problem? You're good. You're good. Okay. <laughs> so, sounds, yeah. yeah, no, this is so interesting. Um, so it sounds like the first two aspects of risk tolerance, it really comes down to having a uh, like a hyper awareness about yourself. Now, the thing with that is you could easily lie to yourself too. That's why you want to have that risk management toolkit. So I'm, I'm just going to give it to you. So, so just go to investdiva.com forward slash masterclass, investdiva.com forward slash masterclass. And there's this like webinar. And then I ex explain exactly all this. And then I give you a risk management toolkit, toolkit at the end of it that you can go and in an Excel sheet, write it down and have it in front of you measurably so that when shit hits the fan, you can go back to it. I'm like, oh, I am missing this because of this. I'm yeah. not that panic, right? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> what are your biggest lessons from investing? I mean, you've given us some, but like if there were like a top three, like what do you feel like you've learned the most from your personal investments? Whether that is in yourself or in the market, either or. Hmm. What I've learned from investing. That's biggest takeaways. Because take away because it typically focus on what are the mistakes people make, and um, so the mistakes people make. We can we can talk about that, and I'll tell you what, what I've learned from it. Um, so it's interesting <clears throat> um, that so the biggest takeaway has been when I'm a consumer, actually understanding why I'm a consumer. So I've become a very aware 
cut consumer and customer. Mm. And every time I look at a company, I go to a, go to a McDonald's or shop on Amazon. Like I, I am here. Okay. I am a part shareholder of this company as a consumer, as a customer. Am I happy with it? Like you start looking at different aspects. And then another interesting thing about investing and then at the same time being an entrepreneur, which I recommend people at least having a business, is that you become more aware of what makes or break a company. So as a business owner, I look, so I, I know like the things that work that have worked for me as a business owner. And I look for them in the companies that I want to invest in because you're basically diversifying your portfolio by investing in other companies. You're basically becoming a shareholder. You are a shareholder, a part owner of a different business. So really the first thing you want to focus on when you're buying any asset is that, okay, if you had trillions of dollars and you could buy the whole company with the management and the products and the marketing team and the culture, and the values they represent, would you buy that whole company? Mm. And if the answer is no, you probably don't want to actually buy their shares, right? right? And one other thing that is that gives you a lot of control and why I love investing in individual stocks as opposed to index funds, which are becoming popular, is because you're voting on a company with your dollars. If a company like goes against your moral beliefs or is that doing something like horrible for the humankind, no matter how good their earnings are, like I don't invest in it. It's my money. Like I don't want to be a part of their growth, right? So it actually gives you a great deal of responsibility as well as, as trust. So when, when I really love a company and their mission and what they stand for, even if their current financials don't look great or if they're not in the best shape, um, I want to support them. So I actually sure. buy, purchase their share. So it can become very personal when you invest. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm really curious. You use the word diversifying, which gets thrown around a lot, especially when you're talking about your own personal portfolio. What's your advice for diversifying? Um, so there is no like there are all these rules. Oh, you want to have 25 assets. You want to have 20 assets. You want to have hundred. There is no real rule. As long as you're confident about the asset you're investing in, right. go invest in it. Cool. Um, so of course, right now my portfolio is like super big. And the reason for that is because, well, it's my, like, I, I do this for a living and we mastermind with my students and a lot of new stocks come up and I like talk to them with mastermind together. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is super exciting. So yes, my portfolio has like 150 stocks in it. You don't, you don't have to do that. And also the same is with cryptocurrencies. Like I'm, as, as I've written a book on cryptocurrency investing for dummies, like I, I constantly talk about it. So there are projects that come to my, um, to my knowledge, to my, um, and that then I'm like, okay, this is like really cool. So I, I invest in more cryptocurrencies that you may uh, do as a person who's just like doing something else and they just want to have some investment. So you don't have to go crazy about diversification, really. I think really your confidence, if you only have confidence in one company, just go invest in one company. Right. Now, I'm really curious to learn what you do personally to, and maybe this is considered a morning routine, but I know that I am friends with a lot of day traders. Um, what do you personally do to get yourself in the right state of mind to work the market? And I say that because, you know, we're talking about investing emotionally. We're talking about swinging for the fences. Um, like, are you doing something beforehand? Just like, you know, anyone would train to, you know, go play in the Olympics or even go out on a date. Like you need to be in the right state of mind. What are you doing for that? All right. I love this question. Are you ready for this? Again, so Let's remember, I'm a value investor, not a day trader. Value yep. investor. So this is what I do. I turn off the news. <laughs> <laughs> I do not look at anything at all. Like literally today it was my, so I, I manage my portfolio once a month and I do it live with our students. And I, if I like wasn't getting DMs, people like panicking on my social media about the markets falling down, I would not have known that the markets were down. 
I, I don't care because I've already set my portfolio. I set something called buy limit orders and I do yep. it like I have a system. Uh, I look at market psychology because markets go up and down because of psychology and emotions. We talk about that. And my favorite assets, I already set, I already told my broker, hey, buy this asset when it drops this much. I already kind of, I don't want to say I, I knew I predicted it, but I, I kind of had like some, some idea that these are the levels it could drop to. And I mitigate my risk by setting buy limit orders, telling my broker, if it drops this, this much, buy. And rest assured, today I opened up my portfolio. I'm like, oh, look, when I was like doing my business and hanging out with my daughter and family and going on vacation, my buy-in orders went through when the markets dropped. So mm -hmm. I don't do, I, I do it the exact opposite. So I first go and find the asset that I want to invest in based on my own knowledge. Then I go on Google and read the news about them and see what they're doing, who their management is, what their products is and all the things. And then I actually go against the crowd. So when something like, I might get into trouble for this, but like Peloton is in like a lot of hot water, like it's like crazy pants. And I'm a user of Peloton and I understand the call. Like I, I get it. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is awesome. They're getting sued. They're getting like all this bad press with like six on the city and this, like they're, they're <laughs> in bad shape, like so bad. And I couldn't be happier because I'm like, look, everybody's panic selling. Be greedy when everybody else is fearful. This is the number one lesson in uh, value investing from Warren Buffett and be fearful when everybody is greedy. So when everybody's panic selling, I'm buying. Now this might come and like bite me in the butt later on, but I did the same like Chipotle back in 2017. People are like, oh my gosh, they have this virus and they, they were making people sick and bad press after bad press. It was plunging, plummeting. I was like, I'm going to buy it because I love my Chipotle and rest assured it went back up. So it's not going to happen every single time, but you have to be, that's why like you have to be a customer, consumer and understand like the branding and the reason why you got into it. So anyways, that's how I, I do it backwards. I love that. And just, that later. just for legal reasons, this is not financial advice. Hashtag um, not financial <laughs> advice. I am not a financial advisor. <laughs> just throwing that out there. But I, I do want to actually piggyback off what you were saying in regards to the quote, you know, be greedy when people are fearful, be fearful when people are being greedy. And it kind of ties into what you were saying earlier in regards to like when Elon sends out a tweet about buy whatever type of cryptocurrency, you know, whatever it is. That goes hand in hand, but I mean, it really does drive the market in a sense, especially nice. w especially with the crypto stuff, right? I just saw that Elon is accepting what is it called, Do a Doge Doge coin mm. at you know the supercharged stations and stuff. And I'm not gonna lie, I, I jumped on that, but oh, um, <laughs> it's, it's fine. It probably will to like do something to it, but yes. So jumping on hype and FOMO is the biggest mistake you can make sometimes it pans out works out for you but the problem with that is that then you get addicted to it yes and then the next time you're like oh elon said dogecoin but dogecoin look how amazing that was now i'm gonna go on twitter and see what else is trending so we become mm -hmm. it becomes gambling unfortunately exactly i think that happened to a lot of people with amc and those other you know um reddit stocks and whatever was going on but it's also happening with ipos oh yeah like yes yeah, 100 so cryptocurrencies are 100 like guilty of driving hype on fomo or for a good reason because like obviously like, this is a revolution like we want to be involved but i'm very very careful with what i invest in um in a sense that again so we talked about like you want to become be a cu customer of a company if you're buying a stock cryptocurrency you can't really be a customer like bitcoin for me is okay i get bitcoin i understand why bitcoin is valuable everything else i don't actually like uh, i don't i'm not very involved in the cryptocurrency community in terms of like coding or mining or staking or staking things like that i'm more like i have the knowledge but i'm not like physically involved so I do have to do a lot more due diligence in mm. assigning value on cryptocurrencies or, or at least like attaching them to a category that I want to involve with, be involved with that have futuristic value. And then, so again, I have a little bit of an advantage. Like I, I get to interview the people who are running their, those networks. Like for example, Cardano, I was able to 
you know, interview Charles Huskinson and like, see what kind of manager, what kind of boss, what kind of leader he is. Do I like trust them to lead this in the right direction? So you want to, you, with cryptocurrencies, um, it, it gets a little bit harder just because if you're not already involved, if you're not already a cus- some sort of a customer or, or user, then you have right. to do a little bit more um, education on your end. For sure. It definitely makes sense. I'm curious, what's a question you wish more people would ask you? I'm sure you get a bunch of questions, not just on podcasts, but in your community with all your students as well. What's a question you wish more people would ask and how would you answer it? Where do I start? <laughs> Really? Well, people because, don't ask that? Well, because my target audience is people who are a little bit more intimidated with, with investing. So the question is like, oh my gosh, I heard about this. I, I'm, I'm seeing like all this hype and FOMO, like what is the best way to get started? So people are cautious about it. And then because I, I work more with women, I think they're a little bit more risk averse in the sense. So um, that, that is where it's like, okay, what's the safest way to start? What's the best way to start? Um, so that's the number one question. The number two question is like that, what, what's the best stock to buy? And I'm like, it's, it's not up to me. It's up to you and your confidence. So right. those are the two questions. And the third question is like, okay, this is great. I got it, uh, but I don't have money to invest in. And I'm like, all right, so go increase your income. So the mm. three questions are where to start, what to invest in, and I don't have money. Now, what drove you to work with women? Is it because you're a woman yourself or is it because, you know, your business coach told you you need to niche down? Like, I'm just curious. Interesting, right? So the first, first of all, we we, we have both men and women, just to be clear. My mission is to help moms, but but our community is like almost 50-50 men and women. But so I first started out, I wanted to help women because I was a minority. So I was the only girl in my class when I was in Japan. I was, I studied electrical engineering and then I was the only girl on my team when I was on Wall Street Mm -hmm. and it was tough. It was hard. Like, like, I'm not going to sugar, like you don't get taken seriously. Like, it's like every, whatever I do, there's going to be something where like, if I do well, or if I like get a promotion, it's like, ah, he got it because of your looks. Or if I don't do, ah, you're on your period. I was like, every, like everything is attached to something about being a woman which is just stupid. Yeah, It is getting a lot better right now. And then that leads to women being intimidated and not wanting to actually invest. And then, so if you think about it, women actually live longer in general than men. So it is so crucial for them to actually invest on their own. And then there's all this like, I mean, no offense, but this like, Wall Street is like very like man, boys club. And then make it more intimidating for women. They think they're not good enough and then they don't invest. And then they are the ones who have to deal with the consequences after like their husbands and spouses have died. So it became a passion of mine to want to help women because they, they, they need to, we have a lot longer retirement. I mean, again, like, yes, some women do die earlier, but in general, not that men don't have to invest. They definitely do, but they, they are, they have, they're more exposed to it. So sure. my goal was to, like make like break down the barriers and that's why like I'm a little bit like goofy and like just dancing around like being like whatever <laughs> that I am on TikTok to to show women that hey you don't have to like be an uptight like man, woman in a suit to being this like anybody can literally do this and it's not like something that is super time consuming so that was the reason why I started out that way but here's a catch right it's interesting that you asked me about my coach because I was like okay I want to help women but at the beginning, it was such a male dominated field that no matter what I did, I only got male students. Interesting. And I was like, okay, they're paying me. All right. Like, come on in, like pay me. So <laughs> it was great, but it was, and I was like, ah, I'm just going to be open to everybody. And I'm just like, yeah, just come on in. And then yes, my coach later did tell me, Hey girl, you got an itch down. So, um, and that is like, because I was open to everybody, I was also talking to nobody. So the interesting thing is when I went back, to not, not only want to help women, but only want to help moms, men, the men who joined were even more passionate about the mission. Like we got like real quality men in our, in our, in our community. Like we kind of, I don't know, I kind of got rid of the douchebags. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, it, it, 
it is like it's a boy anyway so but it's like i'm very proud of our community because people who are that. in are like just awesome because they understand what the mission is and regardless of that they're like yeah i'm a proud investiva i'm like oh my gosh they're just like <laughs> awesome and they bring their like wives in and their daughters in and it's just like super cool so that is so- yeah. That's awesome. Now I want to make sure, and I'm going to let everyone know now that we're going to have all social links, websites, courses, books, all of that good stuff in the show notes of this episode. I do have one more question for you. Um, actually two, I'm going to ask you, where are you hanging out most on social? Just so we can let everyone know. Is it TikTok? Uh, so since TikTok could be banned in the US, let's Instagram, <laughs> Instagram, and Instagram. Facebook. just make sure that you follow the ones that are verified because there are a gazillion impersonators. So Instagram, I check out the DMs if you want to DM me. Uh, Facebook, I do not check the messenger, but you can still DM me. Um, and I'm all I'm on all three majority of times. So okay, cool. Instagram and Facebook. Now, as mentioned, one last question for you. I always ask this question: If you live to whatever year you want to live maybe longer than men, who knows? Um, (laughs) If you live to whatever year you want to live, you hop on as many podcasts, you have as many students, you hit all your goals, you do all of that, but you could only be remembered for one piece of advice. What would it be? Mm, You caught me here. One piece of advice. One piece of advice. Only you can make yourself happy. Only you, what, why, why is that the piece of advice that you want to be remembered for? Because it was life-changing for me. When did you realize that? So I heard this the first time, one, one of the, one of the times that I had hit rock bottom, this is back when I was in Japan. Now, again, I have like relationship issues. Right? So my boyfriend had cheated on me. I was like devastated. And then again, I was like, going got a visa, another rock bottom that we didn't talk about today. And I was just devastated and crying. I'm like, why did he make me so unhappy? And it was one of his friends who was a girl, his classmates who told me this, that you are in charge of your own happiness. Like mm. nobody else can control your happiness. Like stop relying on other people to help you financially, help you emotionally. If you decide to be happy in this very moment, it is just as simple as a decision. So just make that decision. Do yourself that favor and understand that you are in charge. So maybe another way to say it is you are in charge. Yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, we want, we might be able to have to, uh, we might have to do a whole episode on relationships. Apparently I, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I have a husband now. I figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Kiana, thank you again for this opportunity. Um, as mentioned, everything will be in the show notes from socials to websites, courses, all of that good stuff will be in the show notes. So thank you so much for hopping on here. Thank you for having me. This is fun. Born in 92 on the block with the sharks. Come from a different cloth. Y'all will get ripped apart. You want a diamond, then you gotta get it in the dark. We dropping nuggets like Carmelo with the 